Welcome to another edition of our special broadcast. Today we are sitting with the Honorable Dr. Rupert Rupin-Ryan, Minister of Education, and we are examining education one year after the coalition government was ascended to office. Minister, thank you very much for Pleasure. taking the time to sit with us. On assuming office, the government immediately began to talk an overall reform transformation of the education system. If I can ask you, Minister, where are we one year after? Well, let me say first of all that I think that that declaration really had to do with the fact that we feel very strongly that if we're going to fix um, other areas of governmental activity, we have to fix the education system because education is at the heart of everything that we do. The other ministries will perform, I believe, as well as we perform in the education ministry. So we take it, uh, we take it very seriously. Um, and our, our ambition in the Ministry of Education, if I can say so right at the beginning, is to produce not just children who can accumulate many subjects at an examination. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to in the Ministry of Education, lay great stress or lay too much stress on the question of the regurgitation of information. What we are interested in is the development of the whole child. And that is why we lay great stress on not only academic work, but on sports and music and theater and various things. We want to really broaden the experience of the child at school so that at the end of a school career, a child comes out of school, um, you know, uh, uh, as a really integrated whole individual who can either take their place in the world of work or go on further to tertiary education. But immediately upon assuming office, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you identified that needed correction? Well, I think the things that needed correction um, really had to do with, for instance, the, the entire dis the, the matter of discipline, for instance, discipline in the schools. You know, we had had a system of you know, corporal punishment and various things like that. And very early on, I decided that <coughs> I wanted to get rid of corporal punishment by amending the, the education uh, 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 bill. And the reason being that I feel that what children need is more counseling. So we are very interested in training counselors and eventually to get to the point where, you know, ideally speaking, at the end of five years, we can put a counselor in every school. We can't do that at the moment, but what we're going to do is to roll out the counseling you know, as, as we train counselors. We have a situation where, you know, teachers uh, retire here at a very early age, and my feeling is that this entire body of people, with all the experience that they have at the age of 55, that this can be a body from which we recruit um, counselors, intensify training, establish a secretariat of counseling at the ministry, you know, we have a secretariat dealing with the board schools, we have a secretariat dealing with other things. We want to establish a secretariat that would deal with counseling because we attach great importance to the issue of counseling and the entire management of the school in relation to discipline. In terms of some of the challenges you would have encountered so far? Well, I think that the main challenges remain um, the same challenges um, that the government faces in other areas of, of work, budget. There are financial constraints. The things that we want to do and we won't be able to do, you know, in this particular cycle, we may have to do it subsequently. So I think the main constraint has been the financial constraints. If we can, for example, to take, take the issue of um, getting all the sports facilities and all the schools fixed, for instance. This is a big job. We're talking about renovation of, of uh, you know, physical education facilities, sports grounds, and that kind of thing. So that is a, a, big, a, big, a big task. It's only one year, Minister. What yes. would you consider some of your successes, if any, at this point? I think there have been sort of successes in the sense that we are, at the moment, I think, intensifying the work at the, the training college to ensure that our teachers are trained in, you know, what I think of as new methods, um, so that a lot of emphasis, I think, has to be placed on teacher training. 
Um, this for us is very key. We want to ensure that when teachers in the classroom, they are in possession of the skills they need to manage that classroom, to impart knowledge, to stimulate curiosity in the child. These are the things I want to see. Um, you, know, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm very happy when children are passing their examinations. Who would not be happy? But to my mind, the development of the whole child remains my really abiding ambition as far as the classroom is concerned. And I think that to reorient teachers to this idea remains an ongoing challenge. Because teachers are you know, essentially brought up in the old system and that kind of thing to, to get them to really understand what we are about in relation to that overall development is something that I feel is an ongoing challenge and something we have to keep working at. Minister, you had identified some immediate programs that were already in the system that you intended to review. One of this was the, the OLPF program. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an update on where we are with this program? Well, the OLPF program, um, you know, one of the things that we have attempted to, to do is to, in effect, you know, provide um, a laptop to the, the a percentage of the, of the students uh, at the completion of the grade six. That's what we were attempting to do. That, I think, is more manageable. It's within our capacity to do. It gives the children something to strive after. And I think that, you know, we'll continue to do that. But when we come to the whole issue of ICT education, that is an area, I think, where we have to step up our work. The fact of the matter is that, you know, children today, as, as you know, if you come across a child, I mean, I go home, and I mean, the, the people I take guidance from in relation to ICT is my grandchildren. I mean, they, you know, that is their world. We have to, we have to, to learn about that. Um, but my hope is that, you know, we will integrate ICT properly in the curriculum. Um, I've asked for a curriculum review. Curriculum review to ensure, for instance, I don't know um, right now whether we have in the curriculum, for instance, um, a course, say, on what I regard as patriotic education. You know, we have to, I think, you know, cultivate patriotic uh, education in children so that they come out of school with a feeling about Guyana. And I want to see much more of that in the school system. Um, so I think that when I see the results of the curriculum review, we've had a look at how that curriculum is working and see what adjustments we need to make to bring the curriculum in line with what I can think of as modern developments, and especially in, in the area of ICT. You're working on the review at the moment? Yes. Any timeline as to its completion? Well, I would like to ensure that we get the, the, the curriculum review completed and the reforms that are needed within it within this year. I can't tell you what month of this year, but I'm, you know, we, we're at work on it, and I'm hoping that by the end of this year we would be in a position to implement um, you know, new proposals in relation to the curriculum. Minister, can you provide an update on the education bill? Um, the update on that is that the, you know, we, we are looking at that. I think the education bill um, is, is, I'm not sure if it's, within, if it's in the select committee. Um, but that's where it belongs because there's more work to be done on that. There's more consultation to be done on that. What I can tell you is that what I have started to do on my own is really to hold what, I, what, I, what I've been terming education groundings across the country. I started in the Essequibo. And what this is essentially a series of bottom house meetings where the community comes, you know, so you have parents there, you have teachers there, you have students there, and begin to you know, really talk about education in, in that very informal context. Because I feel that when you hold these big conferences, so you, you don't get out of them what you really right. want. Whereas in the intimacy of the bottom house, which is a political tradition in our country, um, I feel that those I've been able to have have been very, very productive. And I'm hoping that, you know, over the next month, next months, I'll be able to, you know, step up, on, step up that program so that we get from the bottom you know, the feeling of parents and teachers and students about what is happening in their schools, what they would like to see in their schools, and so on. So my hope is that these education groundings are also going to provide us with the kind of information that we need, um, and all of that will be put into the Commission of Inquiry. Because as you know, we're holding a Commission of Inquiry into education, 
And in that commission, we are going to be putting all of this information, where the information that we cull from the bottom house groundings, from you know other meetings and so on that we hold with teachers. We're going to put that all into the commission inquiry. So at the end of the end of the year, when the commission comes up with its findings and its recommendations, that we are in a position then to look again at the education bill and see what it is that we need to do in relation to adjustment. I mean, as is talking about the Commission of Inquiry, I know this is your brainchild. Yes. Where are we at the moment? Well, you know, it hasn't, it ha hasn't actually been convened and sitting. At the moment, I am still determining. In fact, I took it to Cabinet a week or maybe a couple of weeks ago. And Cabinet made an input into what they believe the Commission of Inquiry should look like. And <coughs> the, the direction which we're going is to effectively have uh, a fairly small commission um, and to, to bring as witnesses um, people who would testify before the commission, education officers and that kind of thing. So that at the end of the commission we would be in a position, I think, to look again at the education bill and see what kind of inputs we need that would come out of the commission itself. So we have the groundings, the education groundings going on, we have the commission inquiry going on, and all of this is work in progress. This is all happening now, and I think we are going to really see the benefits of that at the, you know, later down in the year when we bring, accumulate all of this new evidence that we have and put it uh, where it belongs, which is in the education bill. Talking about programs that are ongoing and currently rolling off, would we be seeing an expansion any time of the current Hot Meals program? I hope so, because I, uh, I believe the Hot Meals program is one of the, one of the programs um, you know, to which we are most attached. You know, we, the hungry children can't learn. And we are very strong on um, doing everything we can to get that Hot Meal program going. The Hot Meal program is, is beneficial not only to the students who, who benefit from it, but also the farmers who are going to, in fact, you know, step up their own work to produce, you know, for the kitchens and that kind of thing. So my, my hope is that the Hot Meal program is going to be expanded, is going to be refined, that we're going to, you know, iron out whatever kinks there are in the system and get that going. Because um, I, I do believe we want to ensure that children, um, when they sit in the classroom, that they are really receptive to what they're receiving. And, and uh, you know, children are not going to be very receptive if they're hungry. Indeed. Minister, talking about keeping children in school and all the efforts of all the stakeholders, will there be an increase maybe in the school uniform vouchers program? We look at it. Again, you know, the, the constraints that we face in all these areas is, is financial. I mean, you know, once, it, once it's something that we can put to the Ministry of Finance and it is within our, you know, within the, the capacity of, of, the, of the economy to deliver, it's something we would want to increase. We want to increase the vouchers so that, you know, it takes, it takes, more, it takes burdens off parents. I mean, this is, this is the key. Parents are burdened enough and we want, really would like from the Ministry of Education to assist them as much as we can to ensure these children get to school, you know, well provided for, properly fed, properly clothed and things like that without, you know, additional burdens being placed on the parents. So we are going to try everything we can in the Ministry of Education to provide as much support as we can in these areas. Would you say that school dropout at the moment is a major problem in the education sector? It is a big problem. Um, whether it's a major problem, I don't know. But I tell you, it's a big problem. Um, you know, children who drop out of school, I believe this really has to do with a failing on the part of the, of the teachers. It's a failing on the part of parents. And, you know, and that's one of the reasons I believe that the, the strengthening the PTAs in all of the schools is very important to me. Because, you know, the the more that we can strengthen the partnership between parents and teachers to let them understand this is a joint problem and it has, we have to find joint solutions. Parents and teachers have to be working literally in a very active collaboration to get things going. And my own, my own wish is that we are going to strengthen all of the PTAs in the schools 
and establish a PTA secretariat here at the ministry. At the moment, you know, we have a school board secretariat. I want us to have a PTA secretariat as well as a counseling secretariat so that we can deal with the issue of counseling in a systematic and, and, and professional way. And as far as the PTA is concerned, you know, I, I believe that the more involved we can get the parents in what we are trying to do in the schools, the better, better for everyone, the better for the children. In the end, that's, that's, our, that's our responsibility. Minister, if I can take you a little bit back to your budget presentation for 2016. Mm -hmm. There were a few programs that you said that we were going to look at and examine, if I can start with the psychosocial support, that need for that kind of a program. In, in schools across the country? Yes, we need it across the country and we need it particularly in the boarding schools, I mean schools where children are actually being housed. Um, but that is something that is, is very, very important. I read recently of you know, some child who has committed suicide and you know when that happens it's, it's very painful to me. <coughs> it should be painful to any parent. It means that you know, the, the extent to which children require a level of psych, what you call psychosocial support um, is very real and to the extent that we want this thing to succeed, we have to ensure that we strengthen all of the institutions that we have and where we don't have institutions, we put the institutions in place so that this is available to the children. It's something that we need and it, it's tied up with the counselling. Um, and. Uh, you know, as I say, in, in the hinterland schools, for instance, where children are, are away from home, they are in, in, in actual fact, you know, their home is the school. We have to ensure that we put extra effort in ensuring that that environment in which they are staying away from home is one where you know, we have adequate supervision, we have, you know, we have a, above all a humane way of dealing with these children. On the issue with the reintegration of the teenage mothers into the mm -hmm. school system, were you able to? Make well, that, that, that I mean that that's work in progress. I mean we, we need to we need to get these children back in school. Um, you know, teenage teenage parents they are faced with sufficient challenges, and um, I believe that to the extent that they are, you know, about to be about to be mothers. Um, we want to ensure that they are as equipped as they possibly can be to be the kind of mothers that they need to be. And I think that our, you know, uh, that education in school really has to, I think, identify these particular needs of this group of people and uh, lay with stress on, on working with them to ensure that they get the kind of support that they need for these challenges that they're going to face. A lot of these young children um, who are you know producing producing children um, need a lot of uh, a lot of guidance and a lot of help and my own feeling is that that is something that we have to pay attention to in in the schools as well. Do you have a time frame maybe where we're looking at the rolling out of this reintegration program or its reintro or its introduction into the system? The, sorry, what program? The, the reintegration of the teenage mothers program. Um, I would like to see that happen really as early as possible. I don't think that we want to spend a lot of time dawdling over that. Um, you know, the, the longer we spend, um, you know, the more they will drift away into, into areas that we don't want them to drift into. Um, so I believe that the, whatever work we need to be doing in relation to integrating them back into the classroom is, is work that should be stepped up. It should be stepped up. I don't want to give myself a a timeline to do it, but you know, the, the, this is this is ongoing work. And I mean, if we can, if we can achieve, you know, incrementally as we go along, bringing more and more of them into a position where they can, you know, uh, you know, be the kind of be the kind of parents they need to be. I think we will be succeeding. Minister, do you think that there is a need for continuous professional development and capacity building in the education system at the moment? Um, absolutely. I mean, you know, we need to ensure that when these children leave school, um, go either into the workplace or go into further education before getting into the workplace, that we want to ensure that they, we want to ensure that they can do this um, 
you know, sufficiently, with sufficient capacity, sufficient enthusiasm, sufficient energy, um, and so on. Because th this is a this is a real challenge, um, and you know, we get a lot of we get a lot of uh, complaints informally. I get complaints from the private sector, this kind of thing about people, you know, the kind of people they're getting, and so on. And what I say to people in the private sector, help us, help you, you know, you have an interest. These are people who are going to be joining your workforce. You should have an interest in really helping us to produce the kind of employees that you need and what you want. So I think this is an area where there's a lot of scope for the kind of collaboration that is required for the after school, you know, education of people, getting them work ready in a, in a real sense. Minister, if we can shift a little bit mm -hmm. to the learning channel and the ministry's radio broadcast program, yes, yes. how effective do you think this has been? Well, I think it can be more effective. Um, you know, my own feeling is that, um, that the learning channel is I mean, a tremendous tool that we have at our disposal. And I'm not convinced, and it's something we're reviewing at the moment, I'm not convinced we're making as much um, we, we're taking as much advantage of this, of this, um, you know, this uh, um, instrument uh, as we can. Um, you know, as you know, m children are glued to the television set, um, and we want to ensure that the learning channel can be dynamic enough and really you know, engage them in, in a way they need to be engaged. So, I think there's there's work to be done in really all of these areas and I think that the learning channel is an area where we want to concentrate because of its uh, the importance of the kind of impact it can have um, on, 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 the, on the youth. You also mentioned the skills for life training program. Mm -hmm. Will there be an expansion to cater for the hinterland areas in the near future? Well you know one of my big problems which I identified in, in the budget presentation and which I continue to feel is that we still have not managed to close the gap between the hinterland and the coast in relation to um, delivery of services, delivery of education, and so on. So my own feeling is that you know we want to work very hard to ensure that the that gap that we do close that gap that um, that the hinterland schools um, you know we, we we expend more energy than we are presently expending to ensure that the hinterland schools are brought completely on a par with what is being provided on the coast. Um, that is, as I say, ongoing work, but I think that it's, um, it's important that we get it done. On the Three Bs initiative, mm -hmm. that program, there were talks about the introduction of an additional two Bs which is the books and breakfast. Were you able at the Ministry of Education to put this into action? Well, I think that the, the books and, and breakfast program, again, this is, uh, this is very crucial to us. And it remains a project within the ministry. And I think that the efforts we've made so far um, are beginning to bear fruit, and we want to <coughs> ensure that we expand it. Because, um, again, the breakfast program is key to me. I mean, you know, for the same reason we talked about the hot meals, children going to school without breakfast. You know, we, we, we really um, are, uh, you, you know, stymieing their, their development. Um, and uh, books, well, I can't begin to tell you, you know, when I go on, um, I've already had to draw to the attention of the chief education officer. <coughs> and in fact, I. I asked him to write a letter to the, the CEO of the GTNT because I have to pass these billboards that say things like goodbye library, um, welcome. I uh, you know, I, I don't want to encourage this kind of idea. Um, libraries have their place and what I want is children, more children reading. I want to see an expansion of libraries throughout the country. I want to ensure that every school has a library. It's a well-stocked library, and that children have access to this library and have a, uh, you know, look forward to actually getting into the library after class and that kind of thing. Like a library should be a place of excitement, and uh, I want to try to ensure that we can, you know, build the kind of libraries in as many schools as we possibly can, so that we can get more and more children into reading. 
and uh, you know seeing seeing books as a, a, a very necessary, important, and stimulating part of their environment. I mean, this is what I, I want to see. So you know, reading uh, uh, becomes as as natural as, as eating. I mean, it, it, this is this is what you know. I, I think uh, a healthy child. Um, needs. You know, we, we need to stimulate curiosity and all of these things. I, re I mean, I can still, I can still remember the smell of books at the public library when they had the children's section. I don't know if they have it still, but it, when I was at school, which is a long time ago, um, you know, you had you had this children's library um, uh, downstairs, and I, I, I literally can still remember remember the smell of the books. Um, spent a lot of time in there. Um, and I think that you know we have to do what we can to draw children back into into the love of libraries and the love of reading and the love of books. And, you know, that's that's work to be done because we're fighting against the current. That's not where the current is. So that we need to, I think, put a lot of energy into rekindling that kind of um, enthusiasm for reading and for for libraries. But since the Three Bs program was mm -hmm. rolled out, Minister, were you able to do an evaluation on the impact? We have, we, we, we have not been able to do the kind of evaluation that we need. Um, and I'm hoping that, again, that is one of the things that is on our agenda. We need to make an evaluation of it. We need to make what adjustments we need to ensure that the original objectives of the program are being met. On the, you spoke about the need for counselors. Mm -hmm. Were you able to put in motion any initiative, any project, any program to have this become effective? Yes, well, you know what we have begun to do, as I said to you, is that we have, um, you know, a, a very very large number of uh, recently retired teachers. You have teachers retiring at fifty five. At 55, they are really at the top of their game. I mean, these are people who now have accumulated a great deal of experience and so on. And you, you're saying, well, you know, it's time for you to go do something else. Well, I want really to look at this large group of retired teachers and recruit from within that group. Um, and I'm going to be putting out public adverse expenses effect so that retired teachers can apply to the Ministry of Education. And I'm hoping to use this, this pool of resources um, to... Uh, really bring about a transformation in our capacity in relation to counseling because these are precisely the people who I think that we should spend a great deal of time um, you know training as counselors so that as I say we can I can have my ambition which is essentially at, you know over the over the years to have a counselor in every single school I, I think this is what I would like to see um, you know, in the United States and Canada and those places, I mean, uh, counselor, you have a counselor in every school, you know, they, they pay a lot of attention to that aspect of things. And, you know, we may not be able to replicate all of that all at once, but I think we must move in that direction so that we do have um, an adequate number of trained counselors um, so that we can look at establishing um, both the counseling secretariat here at the ministry and the distribution of counselors across the country. Are you also focusing on social workers in the, in the system? Social workers, well, you know, social workers would, I think, yes, of course, and I mean, social workers, there will be a big overlap with, with, with the work that we are attempting to do in relation to, in relation to counseling. We have, we have to see this thing, you know, we've broken up these things into compartments to think about them, um, but the fact of the matter is that social work counseling, um, post-school uh, post education and that kind of thing. Um, it's really one yes. pretty seamless you know, uh, package of, of issues that we have to look at. In the coming months, now the government is in its second year mm -hmm. in office, what are some of the things we can see coming out immediately or in the, in the long term from the education system? Well, I think you can see, I, I, hopefully, um, over the next few months, I would say, that the counseling program is well on track, that the training is, is on the way, that we have begun the provision of counselors in as many schools as we possibly can. Um, I think the 
issue of the curriculum review is going to be available to us over the next few uh, next next few months. We are hoping that the Commission of Inquiry into Education will be doing its work, and at the end of a few months, will come up with its report and its recommendations, um, so that we would be in a position, I think, before, well before the end of the year, to have a package of proposals that we intend to, recommendations that we intend to implement. And this would, I think, go a long way towards bringing about the kind of fundamental changes in the entire education system across the country that we are envisaging. Speaking about vision, where do you see us maybe at the end 2020? <laughs> At the end of 2020, we should be the most educated population in the region. This is what I would like to see. And <coughs> we have really what the region, the rest of the region doesn't have, you know. We have this extraordinary environment. And we have to ensure that, you know, our children, when they, when they come out, uh, that, that they, they have advantages that the rest of the region really doesn't have and we have to maximize those advantages for them. And I think that environmental education is very high on my agenda in relation to this. We want to ensure that children in schools are, you know, are, are climate aware um, and all of that. And I think that we can, we can really lead the region in relation to climate education. Minister, thank you very much. It's, been it's a, a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.